All right, all right, we're on. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Welcome, I'm Christina Walker with Downtown On The Go, part of the Conversations Re Tacoma Planning Committee. Thank you all for coming, welcome. Um, we're so excited about this great panel tonight and you'll hear from them uh, uh, when our moderator starts in a couple minutes. I just wanted to give everybody a little background if you haven't been to Conversations Re Tacoma in the past. Um, and I'm just gonna read you our mission statement so you know where you are, why you're here, maybe. Um, and if you haven't connected with us on social media, please do so you know about future and upcoming conversations. And if you're interested in planning the next set of conversations, let us know as well. We're always looking for new volunteers. So conversations regarding Tacoma has been around almost 10 years. We're a group of design, architecture, and urban planning professionals who have a passion for making Tacoma a better place for everyone who lives here. So this is an annual three-part urban design lecture series here in downtown Tacoma. It provides information, provoke thought, and stimulate discussion about the city's built environment. And if this does spur some conversation, we are going to continue the conversation after at Seven Seas. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors, the Leader in Tacoma sponsors for this year's series, McGranahan Architects, BCRA, BLRB Architects, TCF Architecture, BCE Engineers, and Hargis Engineers. We give them a round of applause. I know a lot of you are in the room, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, we also have a sponsorship from the Harris Architectural Grant, so thank you for their support as well. With that, I'm gonna pass it off to our moderator, Tanya Durant. Are we on? Can we hear me? Okay, great. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for being here tonight. It's my pleasure to moderate this amazing panel of my colleagues. Um, my name is Tanya Duran. I'm the director of the Children's Museum of Tacoma, where we honor children and champion play. And, um, you know, we've been part of this child-centered community journey and conversation for probably about five years. It's really taken off in our community. Um, and I've been involved in that with actually everybody that's uh, at, on the panel this evening with some pretty good work. I think for the Children's Museum, probably our biggest contribution to this conversation is the annual Symposium on Children as Citizens, if any of you have heard of that project. Shameless plug, it's April 19th this coming year. But um, conversations regarding Tacoma, it's, it's slightly different be, uh, than some of our other conversations. Some of our other conversations tend to be a little bit more programmatic. Um, or focusing on the community, but this really focuses on the built environment and the designed environment that we provide um, our children, the stuff that's visible and tangible. But before we dive in, I really would like to um, start tonight by inviting us to all of us to consider our image of the child. Now, what does that mean? Quite simply, the way that you consider children and their capabilities likely results in your actions and interactions with them and your reactions to them. Are they capable? Do they contribute now? Are they creative? Are they valuable to us? It's also been said that communities build monuments to things that they think are important. And as we are contemplating being a child-centered community, what monuments have we built? Are there traces of children? Are they visible in our city? The way that we design our systems and our city for and with children says everything about our image of them. And to the architects and urban planners in the room, we entrust you with this. Thanks to all of you for being here to think about this tonight with us. Um, I'm joined by a panel of great people doing cool things in our community to make it more child-centered. So I'd like to start by asking them each just very simply to say who you are and why you have a passion for this work. So Tiffany, how about you start? Well, hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Yvonne. And I have a passion for child center community because first and foremost, I'm a parent and I live here in Tacoma. I have a six-year-old and he is one of our youngest citizens as well. And I've also been a child as well. And I think that sometimes we often forget that each of us have also been a child. And so oftentimes I challenge and push myself to step back and say, if I was six years old and I'm this high, and I'm walking around this environment, what I feel seen, what I feel like this environment around me, my neighborhood reflected me. 
And I can tell you just being in our city, we have amazing things here. And at the same time, there's so much more that we can do to reflect our children in the built environment that they interact with every day. And that's why for me, I'm very passionate about this work. I think about incidents that have happened, just being out in the community with my son and helping him try to process, well, mommy, well, why is that like that? Well, why don't they have a place for kids here? Those are questions that my child has asked me. And so I think we have to come together as a community to be able to start to shift that. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Carrie. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carrie Wilhelm, and I work for the city of Tacoma as the Safe Routes to School Coordinator. And um, I'm also a parent, so that does help drive the passion. I have a 10-year-old boy. And probably, though, my, my drive is that I was a teacher, so I have a planning background, but I also was a middle school teacher. And one of the things I love most is um, first making sure that the children and youth know that somebody cares because not every child has that luxury. And then letting them get to know their community and from that, finding a way to have them connect with their community. Because once they connect with their community, they're gonna care about their community. And then letting them know they have a voice and their voice matters. And then helping them find the means to make their voice heard. From that, I feel if we have children who know people care, um, in my instance, I want them to know that their municipal government cares. And if they know their community and they know they have a voice, they're going to grow into adults that care about their community and use their voice. So that's kind of my passion and where I come from when it comes to working with youth. Thanks, Terry. Michael? I am Michael McGavick. I've been an architect for more than 30 years, and I'm with McGranahan Architects here in Tacoma. And um, we work with communities up and down the, the Western Washington corridor. And uh, I think schools are some of the most significant investments we make as a society. And the more we can make schools a part of community instead of being apart from community, I think that's really better for children. And um, we bring that to our philosophy and our work. And watching children want to discover, want to engage, want to belong, want to be part of something, want to contribute at any age um, but the more we can tap into that and then design the environment around those longings that they have, um, I think the more successful our work is going to be. And so uh, look forward to talking more about that tonight. I'm Debbie Terwilliger. I'm the Director of Planning and Development for Metro Parks Tacoma. I'm also um, a graduate of the University of Washington Landscape Architecture Program, so um, really excited about that career. And, the, and for the last 30 years in my work, um, there's been a number of themes that are really, really important. And so those themes include youth, right? Because when you, when you care about youth and kids, then you care about families and how the built environment reflects and supports families. And certainly looking around Tacoma, and this has been the case in other places I've worked, um, families look very different now than they may have a number, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. So when you start to care about youth, you also start to think about diversity and you start to think about those kinds of issues and how you reach everybody in the community. And then lastly, I think when you think about youth, you've got to be thinking about sustainability because it's not just about what we have now, but also protecting and designing and, and keeping our environment for the future. So those are, those are all values that I've been really privileged to sort of hold and learn about through my career. And I'm really excited because those are um, key values for Metro Parks Tacoma. So I also look forward to talking more about our projects tonight. Thanks for sharing your passions. And we've got a really interesting mix of folks on the panel, architect and somebody from the city, our parks, a community advocate, activist. So uh, looking forward to next, the way we're gonna organize our time is each panelist is gonna spend about five or so minutes sharing some projects or activities that they or their organizations have done that really sort of highlight um, a child-centered approach. And I'd really like them to share with us the way that they actually engage children and youth in these projects, and maybe what are some of the successes or delights 
that were associated with that and then maybe some of the lessons learned as well. So Michael, why don't we start with you? This is going to be really rapid fire visually because I'm going to talk about three projects tonight and um, they all stem from our desire to uh, design learning environments that are really connected to community. In our mission statement, we talk about um, what we do, that, that education transforms individual lives, and we believe architecture is a big part of that. And so in our firm, we're just dedicated to that. It's almost a service to society. Um, you know, I've been working up and down the Western Washington corridor for the, you know most of my career. Um, but the last five years, I've had the opportunity to work on three projects here in Tacoma. And our kids have challenges in Tacoma. Um, and I love that Tacoma is the size of the town that's big enough to do substantial things, but it's small enough we can get together and connect like this and form these partnerships just on the street or a community like this. So we were asked to really think about the next generation learning environments for Tacoma. And we hit in on these themes like passion and perseverance that helps a person overcome adversity. Or um, that sense of play when you're younger turns into your adolescent years into a passion. And then when you're in high school or college, that turns into a sense of purpose, what you want to do with your life. How can we bring those themes into our conversations about the places we're creating for people who are growing inside them and into our community? So two projects I want to share with you really quickly are the Grant Center for the Expressive Arts. Uh, that's the top circle. And then Bernie Elementary School, the bottom circle. We designed these projects concurrently. And uh, you talk about engagement. We, we went into the schools for, for many days and many evenings, and we asked parents and children to give us their ideas, what matters in their learning environment. And you know, it could have been a swimming pool. Uh, it was you know, a, a lot of trampolines. <laughs> you know, but I think a lot of people, they just wanted to be a place that's really great to be and a great place to hang out and to learn and discover and enjoy each other's company. So we engaged a lot of teachers in both these projects and we cross-pollinated some of the activities and really tried to think about the activities and the experiences that we wanted kids to have in these places and designed some activities that helped us explore that. So to dive into one of the first projects, um, Grant Center for the Expressive Arts, it's arts-infused learning, right? And it's set in this really nice, tightly knit neighborhood just off of 6th Avenue. And so they've got the, the arts and all the businesses there to engage with. But the parents and the kids are really tightly connected. And so this idea of arts infused and, and what they wanted to, uh, to discover, we started to think about the communal spaces in a school, right? And could it be a place that invites community in for acting, drama, art, movement, and, and dining? And then how can we design the building so it has these connections out and connections in? So the neighborhood is sort of breathing into the center of this and through the school. And it's around that at every level of this project we found these connections to the next space and the next space and the next space, right? To where um, we wanted to celebrate that arts-infused learning model and still be in this neighborhood where there really is no front to this site. People come from all directions, right? And so the PTA is really strong. They held all sorts of events there, but they really love this idea of that courtyard in the middle. And we wanted to celebrate those communal things so you can see the drama there and you can see uh, the creative box. And then we've got these core learning settings uh, in between them. But at the corner, it's welcoming and secure. And at the center of this whole place is this courtyard that everybody looks into and passes between their, their different activities through the course of the day and to bring color and a sense of vibrancy. At the ends of the classroom wings, there's a big canvas, so students every year can paint a new mural on it and share that, uh, share their creative passions that way, or always displaying their art, or having a setting that they can do a dramatic performance. And really importantly, in the classrooms, there's a sense of connectedness, so all the teachers can work like partners and, and work together to, to meet the needs of these kids and give them really rich experiences. So I think Reggio Emilia is something that the Children's Museum is really inspired by, so are we, uh, the Montessori method, where the kids are very experiential and hands-on. So that's what we're doing with Grant Center. That's just starting construction. And then down in the south end of Tacoma, the theme on that project um, was how do we create a place that's so enticing kids want to be there every day? They have a lot of challenges just getting out of bed, out of home, on their way, and to school, and in school, we really wanted it to be a place they wanted to belong and, and want to be there. 
and they are the Bernie All Stars. And we have an All Star in the room that I want to call out, <laughs> Aaron Winston. He is the designer of the project we're about to look at. And um, I got to tell you, the, the conversations and the things we developed in the course of thinking about this project um, it was inspirational to me, uh, Aaron, and the way we work together. So I think we, we can say that back and forth. Um, but passion and perseverance, that was this, you know, this enticement, this sense that it's a place I really don't want to belong to. We saw uh, Matt Kelly at the last conversations, and he came out to Bernie, and he worked with the kids and Aaron, and they mapped these places where they feel safe and where they want to be in the school. And so we could see these hot spots on the campus. And I don't wonder if a lot of it's tied to the teacher they had. You know, they enjoyed that space. But a lot of the communal places, places in the school were those places they felt safe and they really wanted to be. We wanted to think of this project as connecting the city and home. This is that place in between, right? And we wanted to think of the, the site itself as these different zones that give them a different experiences. And this idea of community is that's the interface between our society and the school and the families that'll come here. So we have these four classroom wings and then that north-south bar there, that's the place where Families are engaged and students are engaged in a more communal way. And we want a very open feeling to the front of the school on the street, lots of glass. And um, when you come in, the first thing you're greeted by is obviously the administration and your nice secure vestibule. But you look to your right and there's this living room that's built for families. And after hours, that can be open. And it's the Family Connection Center. And it's a place where all sorts of community partners, social services can come meet with families. Um, they can get counseling on budgeting, parents can, right? And there's a safe place for kids to be right there with them. And the whole heart of the school is this welcoming environment that is just one big marketplace of activity and ideas. This is the library right there, right? But part of that library is a community room that anybody can use in the evening. And then the dining area has a prep kitchen in it, a kitchen in it too, so they can learn about food and health in the same place. Now, every one of the classroom areas, we wanted to treat it like a neighborhood in itself. And so classroom is connected to a shared space, which so is connected to outdoors. And so you can see here, there's a communal place, even for a, a grouping of six teachers and their kids to engage each other all day long. And that connection outdoors is really vital. And so that's what this place looks like. Uh, and just very open and welcoming and, and lots of choices for the kids to find their passion. So at that age where you do, uh, the third project is Sammy, and it's out at the park, and it's the Environmental Learning Center. When they started the school, are you a student from there? <laughs> nice, I love it. <laughs> so back in, what, 2009, you guys were in portables. Yep, there you go, they can count from, and so, and they were all over the park, right? And um, the first thing we asked, I don't know if you guys did the survey, but we, we asked, what is your most memorable learning experience and where did it happen? It must have been a class before you. Yeah. Um, and so there were no memorable experiences in any classrooms, I'll tell you that. They were all over the park. And so building on that, we wanted to understand the, the values and the culture of the school and talk to us about the experiences you want people to have. And it, it reminded us of this photograph with Ralph, the science teacher out in the wood with a group of students, Mr. Harrison, right? And uh, are you in it? <laughs> We wanted to think about the building as that kind of place, this group, uh, this gathering in the woods and sort of pull them apart, like you know, the space between trees. It was built into a hillside, so we engaged that with some stairs down. And like a tree canopy, we wanted a shelter over the top of it, right? And so in the center, in that gathering, in that opening, there's this communal space out in the woods along the trail, right? And there's these eddies along the side of the stream where you can have some contemplative space. But throughout the, the, the environment there, we wanted that visibility out, like you can see across deeper into the forest from wherever you are. And the resulting building is this, the Environmental Learning Center. And we've got a bridge into the forest so they can leave the lab and go right into the woods. Um, there's that center of communal space underneath the sheltering canopy, plywood on the walls so you can invite, you know, just whatever you want to do with it. You know, screw into it, display something, work with it. And then all around are these uh, these more contemplative places where you can critique your work, work with a group of students. And that sense of openness and transparency between spaces gives a, everyone a sense of belonging in that place. And the word community was the thing we heard the most. You guys talk about community in SAMI. And so here we have this thing that um, when they gave us the site, 
the park district, the zoo. And they said, great, you can have that piece of property, but we have some activities there. We have some portables. We have our researchers, we have our community outreach program, we have the volunteers and their coordinators. Oh, and by the way, we were gonna start a nature preschool. So if you wanna put all that stuff in this building, you can have the site. So suddenly the project grew quite a bit. And to, so right now, inside that box we are looking at there downstairs, there's the researchers and teachers developing curriculum and students are engaged in research. The volunteers for the park uh, or the zoo, they have their home in this place and students are right there with them. And um, it's just a great asset in our community. And that's the way schools should be. So that partnership of everybody uh, really helped us accomplish our mission on that project. Thank you. I, yeah, thank, let's get my As you were sharing the pictures of Grant Elementary, I was struck by this uh, similarity between the schools in Reggio Emilia, which organize their spaces around a piazza space. So that definitely is wonderful. And I think I was in Sammy just Monday and always am struck when I'm in there on how respectful it is of the children that go to school there. And it gives them choices and options. It trusts them to use the space appropriately and they rise to that challenge. So kudos to uh, you all, Michael. Yeah. <coughs> Tiffany, you wanna share some things with us? So you will see here, I have my phone so I can keep my trusty timer. <laughs> oh, is the timer on? Yeah. Yes, it needs to come off, actually. I think it might be on the first slide only. Well, why they do that, so I wanted to give you a little bit of just background. So, like I said, my name is Tiffany. Um, by livelihood, I am a community cultivation practitioner. And basically what that is, that is someone who literally focuses on building community and focusing on particularly four specific domains of community, if you will. That's social, economic, ecological, and cultural. And a part of my work and training, I, I, I am a part of the International Association for Community Development. Um, we are a part of the United Nations, and so we do work with the United Nations as well. The big focus right now is on the sustainable development goals. But within that work, one of the things that we learned was with Millennium Goals, that at the end of the day, when we talk about community, it really comes down to what is happening right here in your own backyard where you are a community member of and a resident. Um, and so that's the lens in which I come from, very much so from that practitioner. And the other lens that I really come from is being that of a parent and an engaged citizen. I think one of the lessons that I have learned through the years, at the end of the day, nothing happens if the people who reside in the community don't actually get out in the community, get involved and actually have those direct touches. And so I'm going to start with this question mark, and it's intentional. One of the things that I thought about um, as I was preparing for this evening is the question, is Tacoma youth friendly? And I think oftentimes we'll have a question, and instead of sitting and pondering at that question, we start coming up with all the things that go with it. And so I wanted to sit with that question, is Tacoma youth friendly? And I asked myself, you know, what are the characteristics that we look for? What characteristics do we know about um, from research, but also what characteristics do we know about from our actual community, from conversations? And for me, that always goes back to, you know, speaking with our families and our children. And one of the things that I did want to talk about with Youth Friendly Cities is there's a huge body of work around this. And one of my favorites is the Arab, um, Arup report, actually. And it really does come from out of um, the design thinking community, but from an architectural lens. So one of my areas of training is actually in what they call seed methodology. And it comes from out of architecture. And so it looks at social, economic, and environmental design. 
But what I love about this particular approach, it is rooted and steeped in community engagement and what that means. And some of the things that comes out of this larger body of work is from a child's view, going back to something you actually said, Tanya, thinking about what does it look like from a child's world? What does it mean to really have a physical representation of inclusivity? So for example, when we think about even the height of your sidewalk, for example, or what it is to even walk through a door frame, those simple things, these are things that our children talk about. Um, they're very access rich. So one of the things that was really interesting is when we think about where parks and things are located, how do we also expand that? What it means to even have these green strips, so it's even like having these mini parks, right? And going back to say, what does it mean to be seen as a child in your environment in which you live? And so when we talk about youth, I really looked at it from ages 18 years and older because our children go through these developmental phases. And when we build something in our environment, we're not building it normally for a, a year or two years. We're putting a lot of private public investment. So thinking about what does that look like developmentally for our children? And recognizing that our children are some of our critical influencers. So that led me back to some of the work in thinking about what I've been doing here in our community. And I had the honor and the privilege to lead and uh, facilitate community conversations with families through our regional network called Project Child Success with the Children's Museum is also a long-standing partner of as well. And so I said, well, what's say Tacoma? These are some things that were pulled from the parents. So we had an opportunity to go across the city of Tacoma and speak with parents. And why parents? Because parents are actually the primary influencers on their children. And when we think about our built environment, there's this piece around civic engagement that oftentimes can be left out, but it's so critical to the process. But if our parents are not feeling connected civically, then how are we actually gonna cultivate children who feel connected civically? And what does that mean for community engagement and how we develop and shape these partnerships that create the city around us in which we live? These were some of the, um, just some pulled out, there's a whole dearth of this. If you go on the Project Child Success website, you'll find pages and pages of what families have said about the city of Tacoma and Pierce County at large. One of the ones that I really wanted to pull out here, it goes into this piece around engagement. We hear the word engagement a lot. And one of the things that the parents continually said there was not one conversation where this engagement piece didn't come up. Decisions affecting neighborhoods would include the affected neighborhood community members before, not after decisions have been made. Residents would not be put in a position to advocate for their needs due to closed door and under the table decision making. And I pulled that out because one of the things that I often reflect on and I would love to see reflected more on in this shared city and this environment we live is, what do we mean when we say community engagement? Because oftentimes from the parents that I speak to, and I think about the children who are also included in this process, they feel like it's just participation. You wanna speak to me, you wanna get my input, you wanna get my feedback, but how am I that co-decision maker as well? And so that's one of the things that I wanted to touch on, on this community engagement. So why does this matter? When I think about design professionals, in Tacoma, right now, 21.7% of our youth are under age 18. It's okay. And these are our children who are going to grow up to be adults. They're going to be those next builders. And one of the people that I love is Sherry Arnstein's work who did a, a really seminal work with the American Planning Association actually in 1969. And one of the things that came out of this when talking about planning communities, Sherry focused on this sense of, you know, when we talk about community engagement and building the environment around us, we have to also really get underneath and start to dig deeper. And this was from 19, late 1960s about what it means to share and redistribute power. And really what it goes back to is what these parents are saying, what does it mean for me also to be a decision maker 
and making my community. So it's a different degree of engagement, which Roger Hart built upon this work. And so he's known for his work called the Ladders of Participation, and specifically youth participation. And what does that look like? And it was part of a report that he actually did for UNICEF in the 1990s. And for Tacoma, when we think about our children, and we're having an explosion of families who are moving here and our youth, and as we're doing all of these different projects in our community, what's the role of the designer? And so that's one of the things I actually wanted to touch on tonight is that for me, I can tell you up front, I believe that professional designers can be some of our most critical, most powerful catalysts and really reimagining, going back to this piece about reimagining what does our built landscape look like for our kids. But what's going to be key to that is how are we also going to reimagine what it means to engage community? Reimagining what it means to shape our youngest citizens to be a part as a co-designer in the process. And I think that's a, a, a different question to compose. And so that's me and, and my little one, who I am already including in this piece is around what does it mean to be a co-designer? What does it mean to already have that foundation around design thinking, um, for example? And being able to pull from these existing models, being able to build upon our successes, because there's a lot of things emerging in Tacoma. One of the things that families have said is, they appreciate actually how Metro Parks, in their opinion, has been kind of making this pivot and reaching out and connecting with families. And that's one of the things that's come up in that feedback. Um, and thinking also about that redistribution, particularly for them and saying, you know what, we'd love to be able to get to a park, but transportation is a real issue. How are we also going to create within these processes, going back to what we know about accessibility, right? We already know that's been evidence, accessibility rich. How do we start to connect those dots and including those parents' voices? Because parents in our community oftentimes feel invisible. They're very influential, but at the same time, they feel invisible and not really included. And I think one of the last things I just want to touch on and I see Alyssa out here, and this is something we, we work very closely together in the community, of parents saying, I, I, I get tired of when we talk about creating and designing something, everyone wants my input and my feedback, but I'm actually not a part at the table to make the decision. And so that's what I would leave us to, to think on tonight and thinking about how do we use things like seed methodology which is rooted in that community engagement piece, but it is an approach to design. And I did bring handouts. That's the educator in me, so. Tiffany, thank you. In the early learning world, we talk a lot about how relationships are so critical, and so when Tiffany talks about social and, and constructs like that, I do think about that. But it's interesting to think about what is the relationship between the family and the city or the people who, um, we always save the children's museums. We really want to influence the people that have power over the systems that surround our families. And I think in Tacoma, the big systems have done an awesome job of um, starting to engage a little more, more authentically. Speaking of a large system, <laughs> okay. Carrie, I think you're going to go next, right? Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to focus on the part where you said to highlight something that or the organization's doing to move forward. So again, I work for the city of Tacoma uh, as the Safe Routes to School coordinator. So essentially what the city's doing to help uh, move the needle forward in the child-centered journey is they hired me. They brought this position on, and I'm not saying like this me specifically, but um, the city saw a need and it was brought forward, and I'll get into that a little bit later, and they said, yes, we are going to make this happen. We're going to have somebody who is focused on helping um, youth be more focused and safe going to school. So I had this slide more for when I was going to do my introduction of my son is the proud little Bryant Safety Patrol. Um, 
member. And that really just to give a shout out to all our school safety patrol uh, members out there that if you see them on the streets, that is a job adults don't even want to do because it is cold and is early in the morning. And uh, I was a teacher when he started doing this. And then when I got this position, he kind of sadly came up to me and said, I'm going to have to keep doing this, aren't I? Like, <laughs> yeah, your mom's the safe house to school coordinator. You're kind of stuck doing it, kid. So anyways, give them high fives because it's a hard job. So um, I'm just going to go into briefly more what I do in this role so people have an understanding what does the Safe Routes to School coordinator do actually. And my job is wonderful. I work with the youth. If I'm not working with the youth, I'm doing something wrong. So um, Safe Routes to School has, um, they call it the six E's. I'm going to kind of just touch on four of them. One part of my job is encouragement. I am encouraging kids to walk, bike, roll to school. That is what I'm doing. And this is uh, Jefferson Elementary from this year's Walk and Roll to School event. And um, it was fantastic. This is a parent who does this. And the turnout is getting larger and larger and larger. And you can just tell the kids love it. So encouragement of kids. But my harder audience is encouragement of adults to let the kids do this. So this is my picture showing the adults in the room how happy the adults are and how much the kids love it. So um, really just telling adults, please get out of your car and let your kids walk to school. So that's part of it is the encouragement piece. The one that I probably you know, hear about the most is engineering. So I am located in public works. My position is, and I'm in the traffic engineering group. And I work with the engineers to improve the infrastructure. So we work, um, look at the schools and see how we can make it more safe through the built environment for students to walk or bike to school. The other part of it is <laughs> enforcement. Um, and enforcement comes in many different ways. We look at enforcement like, oh, we need police out there. I mean, that's kind of a constant request. But we don't want to go there. That's not part of building community, of having enforcement involved. So while we were, we do work with our police department, enforcement comes as simply as crossing guards, being out there and helping um, make sure that those uh, crosswalks are being used and that adults are essentially following the rules of the road and making sure our children are safe. Education is another part. So I, it can be as simple as helmet fittings, making sure children are wearing helmets and wearing them correctly, to bike rodeos, and um, I might get into a little bit, but I'm working with Tacoma Public Schools, and we are going to have a pedestrian safety curriculum part of PE so that we can help kids learn safe ways to walk to school. And all of this is through the other lens of E, which is equity. Um, we know that schools are strapped, and some schools are struggling more than others. Parents are tired. Parents are busy. They're working two jobs. And so when we look at the schools that maybe I'm out there more helping hands-on, it is through that equity lens with the understanding that there's not an active PTO. There might be more children who have no choice. They have to walk or bike to school because their parents are working. And so um, a lot of what I do is like for Jefferson Elementary, they have an active PTO. They were wonderful. They could do their own walk to school event. I just said, here's some signs, have fun. But other schools, I was physically there. That's part of my job is to be there and help plant that seed and maybe find that champion that can take it over and then grow from there. So. It's just a little bit of overview of what I do. Thanks, Carrie. So two things that really strike me about what Carrie shared, and I think that'll be underscored when Debbie speaks, is the fact that these really big system partners that we have, Tacoma Public Schools, City of Tacoma, they're working together um, in concert to, to solve these problems and to move things forward for children in our community. The other thing that struck me, as you said, training the adults sometimes out of their thinking is the harder thing to do to really put the trust in the children. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Richard Louvre, who wrote Last Child in the Woods. He did a lot of research on how crimes against children are actually not any higher than they were back in the 50s, 60s. 
but for various reasons, maybe it's our media, maybe it's how we're so much more aware of things, we have this fear of giving our children that freedom. So it's, it's oftentimes with our adult construct that creates these limitations for our children. So um, speaking of the great outdoors, Debbie, Metro Parks. It's really exciting listening to you guys. I've rearranged my presentation several times. <laughs> So um, so one of the really wonderful things about working for Metro Parks is that um, it's, it's just a really unique institution. It's, a, it's an actual independent um, special district. So what that means is while we work very closely with the city, we are not of the city. We are our own district. You as taxpayers pay into it. And then as such, we have an elected board of five people, and all they think about is parks. Right? So this is fantastic. We have a tremendous um, level of support. Another thing that's unique about Metro Parks in terms of just figuring out what our park system should look like is that instead of starting with the facility, and I'm a, I'm a total facility geek, right? I'm an infrastructure nerd. I love that kind of stuff. They don't start with that part. They don't start with how many baseball fields do you need per thousand people. Instead, what Metro Parks does is we start with program. We start with what do people want to do? And not just, you know, what do you want to do? What do your kids want to do? And then we back into what kinds of infrastructure and public, you know, the built environment that we need to provide so that people can do those things. So again, I have the best job in the world. I get to build all of the stages for all of those amazing things that people in Tacoma want to do. To do that, though, uh, Metro Parks um, doesn't do it alone and in a vacuum. And again, I think Tacoma is very unique in that the, like I said, the big public institutions are very committed to working with each other because we recognize that many um, folks, you know, yeah, they pay their taxes. They don't make a distinction necessarily between the city or the or Metro Parks as this, you know, special district. They just they they know what they need. Right? They know what they want, and so Metro Parks takes our, our job very seriously as being a partner. So we, uh, honestly, I think we partner with anyone who will partner with us. Right? We love partnering with the school district. We have a very, very close relationship. We love partnering with the city. The city has many, many voices, many, many different departments, and we look for ways of trying to connect with all of them. But we also um, connect and partner with lots of nonprofit entities, lots of groups, lots of, you know, basically anyone who will, will take us on, we look for ways to make those partnerships happen. And I think that's, that's partly one of the things that allows us to, to have some really kind of different results. I'm going to give you an example of a programming thing, and then I'll talk about some facilities, which is, of course, my first love. So how many of you have kids? Youngish kids, medium kids? Yeah. So now I've only been with Metro Parks for about three years, but in talking to some folks who have been there for like 30 years, I mean, Metro Parks, this is a number of years ago, Metro Parks, um, really started coordinating with the school district. And I think the first thing was with School for the Arts. So there was this idea, and I think it was on one of your quotes, Tiffany, that you know every child in Tacoma is our child. And our doesn't mean Metro Parks. Our means Metro Parks, the cities, the school districts. So we have a, we have a shared, um, ownership is the wrong word. We have a shared investment in, in this amazing thing called youth, and they are all ours. And so we know, for example, that from the, the school perspective, the school perspective is that the kids belong to the school from 9 to 4, or 9 to 3. But after that, they, they come to us, and so we provide programming to do that. And so an example of how the coordination works is that for many years, there, we would provide different kinds of after-school programs. But typically, those programs would start about an hour after school ended. And we started to think about it and kind of turn it on its head and realize, well, this may be fine for kids, but it sure isn't fine for the kids' parents because many of them work and have no way of getting their kid from the school to wherever the location of the program is. You know, it's just, it was inconvenient. It might be impossible transportation-wise. It might certainly be impossible cost-wise. So we started to do programming where um, we we basically are doing more programming at the school itself that happens right after school, so there's not that lag time. The, the, the kids, basically, they, they 
they go from being a student, they get a healthy snack, and they go into various kinds of programs. So their their parents really are able to continue doing what parents need to do, right? They're at work, they continue to do that, and they, they know that their kids are safe, they know that their kids are taken care of, they're learning things, they're having fun, and these kinds of programming that we provide is started off with sort of elementary school sports, but it's now expanding to art sorts of things. Just uh, It's more than just um, sports. It's it's a whole range of activities. And so um, I think it's that that notion that, hey, we, we share this responsibility for this precious resource that we have that is a that is part and parcel to the philosophy that that allows these kinds of partnerships to happen and um, again the environmental learning center in Point Defiance Park is this great facility that's a high school in a park right I almost wish I could go back to high school almost to be able to do that so so anyway that's a bit about sort of philosophy and programming but um, I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of different projects where we hope Mr. Parks is really dedicated to community involvement. I think that we're generally seen as pretty good at it, but we recognize that we have a long way to go because we're really good at sort of the traditional ways of community involvement, but what we're understanding is that our traditional ways have not gotten to all the populations and all the folks that we need to. So we are really trying to focus on looking at new ways of doing it. Now, one project that I want to mention is the environmental, no, He's already done that. Eastside Community Center, which is, um, which actually, if you come there on Saturday, we have the grand opening. And believe me, I've been doing a lot on that for um, for the last few weeks. But the the many of you maybe know the story of the Eastside Community Center. It was actually born out of, unfortunately, a tragedy. But it, it started with um, a youth who was interested in, you know, wondering, kind of, as your son did. Where, you know, why aren't there places for us to play? Why aren't there safe places, mom, for us to be in? Unfortunately, this young man was um, shortly thereafter a victim of gun violence. And so the, his friends, his family, and the community really sort of um, gathered together to say, you know what? Why aren't there more safe places? Why can't we have a safe place in our community for our kids? And so the idea of the Eastside Community Center was born. And I won't... I, I think it was probably around four to five years ago, at least when that started to, started to start. But I can tell you that there was a groundswell of support and partnership. And um, re we initially, Metro Parks, started with $6 million from the 2014 bond that people did. And we were able to amass, through partnerships, um, $32 million that build the community center that will be open on Saturday. And so it's really very exciting just to see the, the momentum and the partnership it took. But I think the thing that is really exciting about this center is that we, I think we did do a really good job of engaging the whole community around to figure out what, did, what do they want to do. And indeed, we start with what do you want to do here, right? And some of the, the kind of wild ideas that came out of those sessions were things like, we'd really like a recording studio. We'd really like a teaching kitchen because the east side is considered a food desert, and we really what it, we want a great place where we can learn how to teach or learn how to cook and, and teach others. So um, we actually ha we we included these kind of unique, very um, community specific kinds of features in the program, and we invited youth from the local schools to help us design them. Now again, you know, we're um, we didn't there weren't any audio video designers in the second or third grade classes. But what we did do is we brought those classes together with professionals, and so they learned a bit about the actual design process, and they, they got to sketch, they got to um, develop their ideas, and more importantly, they got to present them to the park board, right? So we talk about how teaching our children to be citizens and to be involved, it was very powerful to have for our park board um, see these kids come up and say, this is what we want in our community center. And so it's it's very, very exciting that, that those, are, those are parts of the facility that you'll see on Saturday if you join us for the grand opening. And so, like I said, we've, we've worked very hard to try to make sure that, that that particular facility is a real reflection of the community who will be using it. And so, um, I think that the way that you set up the design, the way that you set up the process, I think is really key to that. And so all of us as design professionals um, 
it, it really, that, that is a key part of what we come up with. I mean, we all have our brilliant design ideas, but what's really brilliant is watching somebody walk into the room and, and start crying because they can't, they can't believe that this thing exists. So, it, so East Side Community Centers are really a very exciting sort of um, piece. And one thing I wanted to, to touch on, um, Michael was saying that this partnership between the Tacoma Public Schools and Metro Parks is really key. And many of you may not know this, but the, the space that the Environmental Learning Center sits in inside the, the, the uh, zoo is actually a leased space. And we, Metro Parks, are leasing space from the school district on the First Creek Mill School site, which is where East Side is. And so it's a reciprocal lease. So those two facilities actually are much cl much closer linked than you'd ever know. But again, that's that's not something that most people care to know about the details, but it's being committed to making those kinds of details work that make these kind of projects work. So the last thing I'm going to mention here, because we've got more questions to go, is just, is just to reiterate this notion of how important it is for us to make sure that, that people, kids, parents, can actually access our parks. That's a key part of equity, right? And so more and more, we're gonna be working together with Carrie to not just figure out safe routes to schools, but safe routes to parks, and to figure out kind of new and innovative ways that we can really make it so that it's safe, so that everybody can, can have more of an access to the city. So I'll stop there. When I listen to the way these large systems are working together, it makes me feel like we're we're already really down the road of being, you know, kid centric and, and child centric. So thank you. So I wanna I wanna roll into some questions that I'd like our panelists to respond to a little bit. Um, you know, I'm curious, and actually Debbie, you might be a good person to start to kick us off on this one. I'm curious what was upstream for you and your organizations. Um, to sort of come into this place of being more child-centered? You know, can you talk about the process of the, or the evolution for your organization? I mean, Michael, I remember you and I had a glass of wine after I got back from Italy because you were so curious to understand what I learned there. And I, I mean, and we've done so much more since there together to, to grow both of our organization's capacity to think about those things. Um, but, you know, Debbie, what's interesting for me is parks have always been about children, but there's a marked difference in the way Metro Parks approaches that now than you did 10 years ago. So can you talk a little bit about what you think might have been the recipe to get you to more child-centric um, thinking? And then I'd love Michael and Carrie to talk about that too. So I'll give you my theory, which somebody who's been here only three years, and then some experience of somebody who's been here longer. So I'm gonna use an analogy for my theory. And we know that, um, Ex designing for accessibility is something that we all do, right? The ADA requires that. But I think that once you get beyond the mandate, you realize that when you are, when you're creating universal design, you're making things better for everybody. It's not simply meeting a, a strict mandate. It's truly making better facilities that benefit a whole bunch of folks. So my personal theory is that, what and what I've seen just in the policy direction for Metro Parks is this recognition that we have a lot of goals, sustainability, diversity. Um, but to really focus and to make sure that we're getting to all the populations we want, if we start with the kids, everything else follows, like I said. You, you care about the kids, that means you have to start thinking about the parents and how parents get people, get their kids places, and, and, and so on. So I think that the focus on kids has allowed us to, to really be able to kind of maximize some of those other thoughts as well as then being able to provide for, for all age groups. And, it, and specifically, Metro Parks in our strategic plan that we updated this year made a, a market effort to say youth is our priority. So, so I think that's part of it. Now, from talking with folks who have been a part of the system for a long, long time, again, the, the, the part that they would echo is that they, we really started focusing more on youth populations that way when the SOTA School for the Arts and Metro Parks, that when there, be, there was this partnership that occurred. Because again, all of a sudden, in order to be able to kind of um, meld those programs, 
we started to have to think, okay, what's it going to take to for those kids to be able to participate in our program? So I think that it, that might have been a catalyst, but it's it's always been something that's important. And then the last thing I want to say is, Metro Parks, n none of us in government or non-governmental sectors wants to duplicate services, right? I mean, there's just there's so many things to do. So we we work really hard to understand who else is out there providing adult programs, senior programs, et cetera, and we try to make sure that we're fitting the niche as the best niche and not duplicating. And while there's, and we do know that there's a lot of folks working on behalf of youth, that's a particular area that I think we can really contribute to. So Michael, as part of the architecture community, <laughs> you're responsible for building the buildings and the things that we interact with. You're responsible for beauty, so what was in your thinking years ago that had you guys shifting to be a little bit more child-centered? I think we've, um, we've learned a lot about human capacity. Um, this is a, th a thread that's, that's going through my, my mind right now, in, in that the capacity to learn, the capacity to grow, the capacity to overcome challenges, the capacity to empathize with another person, it's really under uh, well, under understood one, <laughs> but um, I think it's undervalued and it's not really known. And our systems are not organized to acknowledge that. When we're wanting everybody at the same age to progress from one grade to the next, or we're delivering the same curriculum to everybody, I I really have seen a lot of recognition of the individual capabilities and interests and passions of every child, and the greater diversity of services we're offering in our schools to meet those individual needs. And at the same time, we're watching just more adverse childhood experiences uh, present in our schools, in our learning environments. So the challenges are just mounting. But then you see these examples, and you mentioned SODA. I think when the School of the Arts formed, and I got interested in it, and I've followed it now for 18 years, right? The growth of, of that little seed of a school into now Sammy and Idea, and it's becoming the biggest high school in town, right? But it's around that idea that we value the interest and the passion, the capability of the individual. You mentioned, Tanya, the way that you come into that place and everyone comports themselves with great respect for each other and expectation of that, and that you value some, you have a strength, somebody else said, I love talking to Soda students and, and Sammy students, because they get this, that, that I have a strength for somebody else, and they have a strength for me. And we're all a community that's there to, to make that happen. And we all walk across the stage together, but so much more. And um, so the more we can uh, tap into that human potential in the way we think about the, the activities and, and what are having people do in the place. And that's why in the, our work on recent projects, we talk more about the activity and the experiences. And talk to me about the setting after. Because that's what I want to serve. So. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because the remedy to, um, to helping children who have experienced adverse childhood you know, experiences is really this careful marriage of environment and relationship. There's nothing more important to a child than a relationship. And um, there's nothing more meaningful to their learning than having a rich environment. So having the architecture community, those who are responsible for building our educational facilities, is really amazing to see that kind of thinking happening. So, so yay to that. So Carrie, I'm curious, I've seen a marked change in the city. And um, I think that the city's had a tendency, oh, children are important, but they're actually really doing stuff to show that they think that. Um, from the mayor down to things like in the 2025 planning process, incorporating the voices of youth. They put a link to the Children's Museum Symposium on their website. So so can you talk a little bit about what you think might have created that shift? Uh, yeah. So uh, back a few years ago, I'm not sure how many it was, but one of our wonderful partners, the Puyallup Watershed uh, Active Transportation Community of Interest, uh, did a study, and they found that in 2010 through 2014, every eight days, approximately, a child in Tacoma was hit by a car walking or biking. Um, between 2010 and 2014, uh, there were 222 youth under the age of hit teen, um, 18 hit by a car walking or biking. And so when they saw that, they're, they're like, there's a problem. 
And so they approached the city of Tacoma and the city of Tacoma immediately responded. Um, like you said, I don't think any city is, you know, goes into running their city being like, we don't care about children, but it was something where clearly there was a problem and they were ready to take it on. And from that, they came um, with the Safe Routes to School Action Plan that was approved last year. And I think it was that that changed the focus, that when they realized, when they saw those numbers, uh, it was time to focus and it was time to have a change and um, and focus on those youth. Now we have to remember when we talk about schools, there's 53 public schools in the city of Tacoma. We are the third largest school district in the state of Washington and that's not including, we have a lot of private schools and we have a charter or a couple charter schools. We are saturated with schools. So when we are saying we're focusing on schools, sometimes I feel like we're focusing on the entirety of the city of Tacoma because within every mile, there's another school and there's another school. Uh, and that's, you're correct. The city manager has it as one of um, the goals is walkability and safe routes. And it is a very supported thing right now. I will be sitting in a meeting that has nothing to do with schools and something will come up and I see an engineer just kind of lean over and be like, hey, there's a school right there. It's just now the focus, and it's on, um, I think, everyone's mind that we need to make this more safe for our children, and they're doing it. Yeah. We have 35 elementary schools in Tacoma, so lots of little people that we're serving. Um, Tiffany, I'm curious, your answer to this question, I'd love you to think about, as a kind of a bridge builder, what do you think, so I think we've seen a lot of good work from the system partners working together and really thinking about children being at the center, but what... What advice would you have for our systems about connecting more um, effectively with families? To totally put you on the spot. I think and I want an, my staff to take notes. No, I think it's an important question. And I'll preface saying I can't speak for all families in Tacoma. And it it's really is an honor and privilege to be invited into people's homes and to have the opportunity to honestly to just listen to listen and learn. Um, I think one of the things that's really present for me right now is thinking about that letters of participation. And it looks at different degrees of engagement. I think one of the things that has been really sitting with me this past year, and I think about families, is the proliferation of design thinking, how it's spilling out into communities. And, and the first step within that is actually to empathize. And I think that's one of the things that makes me really super passionate about design thinking and what that looks like to actually engage and connect with families. And it goes back to something you touched on earlier about relationship. So in the work that I do, one of the things that I often say at the end of the day, I don't care what organization you're part of, I don't care what company, what government, it doesn't matter. Community is relationship. It is this network of interrelated relationships. And so when I think about Tacoma and our successes that we have, I would say the thread that goes through each of what you share, it's about building the relationships. And so you're building relationships with each other, thinking about institutions. But we also hear these pieces of how we're building those relationships with our families. And what I ask myself is to imagine how much more child-centered could we be when we also start to have these beautifully powerful interconnected relationships with our families, the same way that we're seeing at our institutions. And there's so much tremendous potential there and going back to this sense of capacity, we are also at a very interesting time when we look at um, just the interconnected challenges that our cities and our organizations are facing. When we look at how much more our resources really in some ways can't be stretched. But when you go back to human capacity, there's so many rich examples that when we pull together, when we really look at how does that look from every level of the community and thinking that within our city, we have so many families, your capacity actually can expand. 
And so that would be some of the pieces that I would um, put for us to think about as we're moving forward in this journey of the child center community. I'm reminded of that phrase that uh, children are not em empty vessels to be filled. They have fires in them that we are responsible for fanning. And, you know, I run a nonprofit. You run tax, you know, payer, you know, the taxpayers pay for your work. Rather than this, us tell them what they think they ought to be doing, there's this really community shift to this authentic listening and and um, sharing our gifts, our agency's gifts, where they're wanted and needed. So I think that's really an interesting thing that I'm thinking about right now. So we have just a few more questions. I'd love to hear, so today is really about design and design thinking and, and building. So what would you all love to physically see happening? We talked a lot about ph philosophy and relationships. What would you like to see physically happening in our city that would show that we are child-centered. Traces of children, making them visible. What symbols would you see? If you were a stranger driving through Tacoma, what symbols would you like these strangers to see that would send messages to them that we put children at the center? Can I start? Yeah, and I've got about 25 if you run out. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I have a vision. You know, every, you have to have a vision to keep you going. So they drive into Tacoma, and they see kids riding their bikes. I mean, that's a physical thing. Um, I guess from an engineering standout, we have bulb outs everywhere. The, those are, it's, anyways, in crosswalks. And, um, and then when you go to the schools, it's overflowing with bikes. And the bike racks are covered because we appreciate the fact that, like, us, when we ride our bikes, we would like covered parking, so would children. And so the bike racks are covered, and that maybe there's um, some placemaking in the sense of along the sidewalks, like showing directions of the walking routes of getting to school are painted in a fun way um, that just kind of guide the kids and also let people know that kids are present and that's how they get to school. Um, and just that they're out. You go into neighborhoods, and there's some neighborhoods where there are kids out actively playing and they're comfortable. And I want every neighborhood in Tacoma to be that way. And I want it at the end of the day, you just see kids walking and with their friends and hopping on their bikes and going to the park <laughs> um, or going home. That it's you see the children and that we have the environment set up that they feel safe. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I would like to see every school in Tacoma renamed Community Center. McCarver Community Center, Stewart Community Center, Lincoln Community Center. You feel invited into a community center, right? And I think our concept of schools in our society are not inviting. They're apart from their place you send your kids and you pick them up later. And I don't have a connection to that place, except when it's parent night, right? I got to talk to the teacher about what's going on. Uh, and that's what I think we've been trying to think about how you make that place enticing for an entire family, how you make it welcoming for a family, and just other community partners or people in the neighborhood, senior citizens who want to come in and mentor some young kids, feel welcome to do so. And I think Josh Garcia said this about safety in schools. You don't put up walls, but you open it wide open, and that's how to make it safe, when people feel connected to it and take ownership of it. And so if we had community centers everywhere you walk or you bike, um, and you pass by another community center every mile, how would our community feel different? And then maybe that's the way we capture families. What do you think? I'll go one better. Okay. <laughs> It's, it's really building on the same concept that that whether they're schools or community centers, they're, they're community um, facilities, period, right? So one of the things we've talked about in our next step of planning is really looking at designating schools as parks. Given all of the different schools, I and mean, when you think about it, 
There's, um, I mean, there's playgrounds, there's school grounds. There's a, there's a lot of things that, um, from a school perspective, again, after the school day is over, there's a lot of schools that are just closed off at night, right? Those spaces are closed. But what would it look like if we kind of um, rethought it so that not only do we have in a Tacoma this amazing array of park parks, but we started blending that definition a little bit differently. I mean, so ultimately we end up with a city within a park overall. Tiffany? Well, I love this question. I dream about this a lot. <laughs> um, for me, one of the things that I imagine, especially in listening to other family stories, is I want to see an increased tree canopy. It's so amazing how green bereft, is the way I call it, some of our families feel. And so reimagining places that can become greenways, but not even just greenways. We also have to keep in mind that we have some complex social issues that we're trying to also navigate as a community. I don't want just greenways. I also want to see greenways that are foodways, places where people come together in our community and they're growing food together. And if you're hungry, it's there for you to eat. You can get it. Um, I want to reinvigorate what it means to have public spaces that are actually public. We, we have this thing, we'll call things public, but they're really not necessarily public per se. But what does it mean to reinvigorate and have the public commons where people can gather? And when I think about gathering, I wanna see multi-generational gatherings. How do we also make it easy for our youngest citizens to be able to build relationships with our seniors and our elders in our community? And having that type of accessibility, inclusivity, um, what does it mean? Tacoma is so unique in our state. We have one of the most diverse cities in the state of Washington. How is that also reflected? How are we building upon the culture, richness that exists here in our community? How is it showing up in art? How is it showing up even in the architecture that is around us, for example? Um, and even thinking about, we also have a, an, another nation <laughs> that literally is our next door neighbor. How is that also be represented in our community? And creating opportunities, you touched on earlier about learning from one another, and I love that. I want to have more opportunities where we get to learn from one another. I think the other thing that comes up that I hear a lot is I want to know my neighbor. And so knowing your neighbor, how do we rethink what it means to live in a community? Going back to this sense of having the doors open, what does it mean even with our own patches of where we live? to create these spaces where we can connect. So for example, on my block, I actually happen to know all my neighbors. We also do community dinners together. One of my visions that I have, I would love to have the street closed off, have a long table that runs down. It's a potluck style dinner and you come and you eat and you have conversation and you reimagine what our streetscape can become. We have projects already that are happening or reimagining what streetscapes can be on park day, for example. I want to expand and build upon that. And that's what really excites me when I think about the possibilities of when we stretch design and how design can really infiltrate and show up in so many different ways. So we have about 15 minutes left. I've got another question I could ask, but I was wondering if anybody in the audience has any questions that they would like to ask our panel. Yes, go ahead. Do you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was, what neighborhood do we think is doing a good job in Tacoma of being child-centered? I'll say the school, see I'm so school, sorry, um, that was surprisingly like incredibly child-centered was Stafford Elementary, which is far south 
uh, I think at the very border. Yeah, far south. It's kind of this forgotten, beautiful little um, school that uh, when they do bike events, they have over 100 kids show up on their bikes. And if you ever have an opportunity to see the school, it is such a beautiful, like, community-filled school, and it is um, a high immigrant population uh, that goes there. But just by the fact of the number of kids that just by saying, hey, guys, we're riding a bike today, and they do it, to me, shows it's um, a youth-centered, at least, school, like, and they feel safe doing it. Debbie, do you have? It's interesting. I mean, I think the reason I was silent for so long is that it's, you know, we, we talked about our what would be the marker of a good child-friendly piece. And obviously we're not there yet enough, right? But I started to think of where are those neighborhoods where you're starting to see the kind of urban design that, that knits things together. And I, I'm very intrigued by the Lincoln District, right? I mean, the Lincoln District has a combination of a number of things going on, not the least of which is that the city has put some serious investment in the infrastructure. Uh, from a park perspective, we're going to be putting some serious improvements into Lincoln Park. The, you know, the school itself has some things. So it seems like where there are synergies of, of energy, and not just public sector, although that's what I'm most familiar with, I think that's where you start to see these kind of sticky spaces that are that are a little bit more enticing for people to go through. So so I think that's that's an area where we're starting to see some exciting things. I love Hilltop. I think Hilltop is um, a really wonderful place to, to be. I mean, it is it is transforming. It's still, you know, it's changing, right? But I I don't know that it's necessarily child center or child friendly. But it fe it's starting to have a sense or a different feel in terms of a neighborhood where where it's a, of a scale where the kinds of things that we're talking about might occur. There was another question. Yeah. Food. Yeah. Food. Well, they're all saying food. I would say yes. I would kind of push back just a little bit and say, when I think about community engagement, I actually don't think about getting someone to come to my event. I think for me as a practitioner, I ask myself, where are people already naturally congregating and how do I come to you? That's kind of the question that I go back to. And I'm actually going to toot the horn of the Children's Museum here a little bit. Um, one of the things she that... She was not paid. No, I'm not paid to do this. But one of the things that I've observed and that I've really appreciated that with the play to learn groups, um, having the opportunity to interact with the play to learn team and listening to feedback and saying that the community is wanting more groups and but getting to the museum can be a barrier actually for a lot of our families here. And the fact that you put the effort in bringing a play to learn group saying, we're gonna come to the communities, I think that's something that stands out to me. I think another example is our community partner here from PB, PBS actually, and the work that they're doing. They also, they go to the families. And they also take that opportunity to say, you know, it's not just about this program we're trying to bring, what is it that you're wanting to see? And then they go out and they recreate it and they do it. And that attracts because when people feel seen and they feel heard and they are visible, they're willing to show up and, and come. And then on a very tactical perspective, I think you have to really know your audience. So if your audience is very digital oriented, I think Facebook can, can be a tool from a very tactical perspective. I'll also, I'm, I'm gonna have to go to another community partner I'm also familiar with, and, and, and that's Tacoma Housing Authority. I think one of the things that I found unique that they do, because they have properties, they have residents. And I was really surprised, they said, oh yeah, we actually have this newsletter that we send out just to our residents. So that's not something that's digital, but taking those additional steps to see what's right for the community members that we 
are connected with or we want to get connected with? I think one thing we're learning is that, again, we Metro Parks has a pretty good reputation, but we, we aren't necessarily, um, people don't know us in different communities. So with Eastside as an example, we, we have a steering committee of kind of people that were differently involved within their community and obviously were willing to volunteer time to spend there. And so in the early phases of trying to figure out what the program should be, we actually had the, the community, um, those members go out and sort of host their own focus groups with their friends and their acquaintances and their groups because, you know, they don't know Debbie Terwilliger from, you know, Eve, but they definitely know their connector in the community. And so so it's a way of, of again, building on or uh, taking advantage of those relationships that exist for the purpose of, of, of really tapping into it and giving honest feedback. And so it's maybe not us directly, but it's it's creating a network then that then they can all support back to what we're doing. So engaging, I guess, trusted sources within the community, I think that can help. Great. Um, one last quick question from anybody? Okay. Oh, yeah, go ahead. What's missing? What's Tacoma missing? My first thought, because it, it um, the idea that, that um, places that are engaging for people are places that they're about something. And uh, I think about Tacoma with the schools we're working with. And so my experience with the School of the Arts, they were about something, right, when they started that. And people want to belong to that. They want to contribute. They want to have a piece of that, right? And you get Sammy. And that uh, Grant Center for the Expressive Arts, they were about something. And I think Stafford is the same way. Aren't they, they have an arts-infused program there, right? And so they're about something, right? They're not just a school. They were about school this way. And uh, that draws people in, right? And I would like, and it's that diversity of opportunity. And so um, I would, what's missing is more of that cultivation. And uh, hopefully it's replacing those series of unique things that people have decided they want to be about. Um, and it breaks down the monolithic aspects of, and I, the partnerships I think are breaking down the monolithic nature of our civic institutions, right? And so um, I don't feel like something's missing. I'm, I'm looking for something that's growing and wanting more of that. And that's, that's why I like Tacoma, because you just get more and more evidence of that all the time. That was my reaction, that it's time. We're not missing time, but it's just taking time. And I think it's getting more interesting every year. Debbie? And just a missing, that's maybe the, the a, a different way to think about it. You look at the Tacoma Mall sub area plan that just concluded. And when that plan is done, it's going to be amazing because what will have happened is you will have transformed an area that's really not a human scale area, right? The It doesn't have the kinds of of intimate, safe, human scale connections through pedestrian ways. I mean, it's going to literally have to transform itself from, you know, this big Borgish thing, you know, to something really, well, I don't know of a good, another good Star Trek analogy, but something, something of a, of a different scale. And so we've got some landscapes, if you will, that are, that are just out of scale for the kind of thing that we're talking about that need to kind of shift. Thank you. So we are at the end of our time. I just wanted to make a couple of observations and, and announcements. I, I don't know if anybody noticed, but the name of this panel was actually building a youth, is Tacoma Youth Friendly, Youth Centered. And I did moderator's privilege and I decided to say children because I feel like oftentimes when we talk about youth, that automatically has our heads starting at 9, 10, 11. And I don't want us to dismiss the gifts that our youngest children have. They may not be um, able to work with us on the cognitive or physical level than an older child can, but I'd argue we should take their lead in the social-emotional sector. So thank you for allowing me to do that. Um, and I also 
am really struck by, even though we're here to talk about building, um, we talked more about people, didn't we, and relationships. And um, we need to come together to not let our children down. We have to put them at the center. They can't do it for themselves. And I think we, as a community, another shameless plug, we have an opportunity with Tacoma Creates to really make a statement that we're putting children first. A, about a third of that project will go directly into providing the kind of after-school programs you were talking about. We'll do the same thing with arts and culture. 99% of children, when asked, say they want more art in their lives. So this could be a really cool opportunity, so I encourage you to look into that. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was, of course, thanks to our host, Rain, for opening your beautiful building to us tonight. There's a cool science-y thing on the back screen that I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you about. It's pretty nifty. Um, that there will be an after conversation, kind of the after parties across the street at Seven Scenes Brewery. So if you want to continue thinking and talking together, feel free to do that. Um, the next conversations regarding Tacoma will be the evening of November 1st. So I encourage everybody to think about attending that. And with that, I just want to thank you for your time and let's give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs>